Hi, welcome back to Buffers in Biochemistry. My name is Kevin Tolkoff. Make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about how if you know the pH that you want a buffer to be at that you're preparing, and you know the pKa that's applicable for that particular buffer system, how do you calculate two things? Number one, how do you calculate the concentration of the conjugate base? And how do you calculate the concentration of the conjugate acid in the buffer? So these are the two things that we want to calculate. And you may look at this first equation, which is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. This is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And you say, well, I know the pH and I know the pKa that's applicable here, but I have two variables. So how do you solve one equation with two unknowns? And the answer is, if you expect to be able to do that, you need a second equation because you can solve two equations with two unknowns and that's going to be a system of, of equations approach. Okay, so this is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. We're also going to use something later on called the mass balance equation. Okay, and we're going to look at a generic, up, a gen, up here, a generic uh, system of deprotonations governed, each, each one of them is governed by an equilibrium constant denoted Ka1, 2, and 3. Now recall that if I have if I have a Ka, okay, so I have any Ka, and what if I transform it by taking the negative log base 10 of the Ka, then that's just simply the pKa. So all I did was I just took the negative log of whatever the Ka is and got the pKa. So really the Ka and the pKa are representations of the exact same thing. Okay, so this first deprotonation, this first equilibrium where I start with the fully protonated form of the species, H3A, by the way it has a zero charge, so this first deprotonation of H3A, which is the fully protonated form of the species and it has a neutral charge, deprotonation to H2A minus is governed by the first equilibrium constant Ka1. Okay, so pKa1 is just a transformation of Ka1. They both represent the same thing. And so if I remove a proton, the proton count goes from 3 to 2 here, and then the charge also drops by 1, because since protons have a positive 1 charge, if I remove a positive 1 charge, the charge should go down by 1, and that's why it goes from 0 to minus 1. And the same thing is essentially true of the next two deprotonations. The second one is also governed by an equilibrium constant, Ka2 in this case. I could take the negative log of that and get pKa2, and they are still representations of this step in which I deprotonate H2A minus to make HA2 minus. And then finally, the same thing is true here. This last deprotonation is governed by a Ka3. I can take the negative log of that to get pKa3, where I deprotonate HA2 minus to get A3 minus. Okay, now when I am making a buffer, and this goes for any type of buffer problem, okay, I, number one, I have to know the pH of the buffer that I'm going to use. Okay, so for this particular problem, um, in general, I'm going to look at the pH, okay, so what is my pH? Well, it has to be specified in the problem as to what kind of buffer I want, okay? And the rule is, so the pH that I want is known, all right? Now, the pKa that, that I have should be very close to the pH that's desired for the buffer. And the general rule to get the maximum buffering capacity is this, is that the pH that I want the buffer to be at should be between one less of the pKa, so one pH unit less than the pKa, and then one unit above the pKa. Okay, so in other words, if my pKa in this case, and I'm going to choose this one based on the problem, you'll see. So if the pKa that I chose was 7.21, then the buffering pH would have to be between 6.21 and 8.21. And what I would say is that if the pH that I desire the buffer to be at, if it's within this range, 6.21 to 8.21, then I have maximum buffering capacity. And in general, the closer you are to the pKa, uh, the higher the buffering capacity. So if I wanted the pH to be, say, 7, 7 is within the range of 6.21 to 8.21, so that would be a that would basically be a, um, a buffer system that I could use. Okay, but the question remains: How do I go about calculating the concentration of conjugate base and acid at a given pH if I know the pKa? Well, number one, I'm going to start with this Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 
pKa over to the other side. Okay, so I'm going to subtract pKa from this side. It cancels it there. And then I'm going to subtract it over to this side as well. That's going to give me, I get the pH minus the pKa is equal to the log, and this is base 10, log, let me actually make that a little neater, log base 10 of the conjugate base concentration over the conjugate acid concentration. Okay, now this logarithm right here, it's in base 10, it doesn't do me any good to leave that there. So there's a way you can undo a logarithm. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at this base right here, it's 10, and I'm going to do 10 to the power of all of this in here. And what that's essentially going to do is it's going to get rid of the logarithm. So this, when you take the base and raise it to this whole logarithmic power, that's essentially an anti-logarithmic function, okay? And then I have to do that to this side too, so I get 10 to the pH minus the pKa, okay? Now, for simplicity, I'm going to call this left side of the equation, 10 to the pH minus the pKa, I'm going to call this the Greek letter chi, okay? It kind of looks like an X. I'm going to call that chi. And because I undid the logarithm, now I have this relationship that chi is equal to the concentration of conjugate base divided by the concentration of the conjugate acid, okay? So what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to multiply both sides here by the concentration of the conjugate acid. So this whole thing, the chi here, is going to get multiplied by that. And notice that cancels it on this side. And so I get this relationship right here, that chi times the concentration of conjugate acid has to equal the concentration of conjugate base. Now, recall, a concentration is usually given, at least in this case, it is given in moles per liter. This, con this and, and this could be some number of moles right here, this concentration is also given in some number of moles per liter. The number of moles may be very different. In fact, it probably is very different. But the volume of the buffer is actually the same. The number of liters of the total buffer is identical. So you can actually um, get rid of the liters here and you can end up with an equivalent relationship that chi times the number of moles of conjugate acid is equal to the number of moles of conjugate base. Okay, so that is, this is one of the important relationships here then from the Henderson-Hasselbeck and we're actually going to use this in a little bit. Okay, now Going to another thing, and this may, may, not, may not make a lot of sense why we're doing this, but we've, we've gone as far as we can with the Henderson-Hasselbeck, okay? Chi is something we can, we can calculate, okay? But we have two variables here. Again, we have an equation, one equation with two variables, so we need another equation to simplify it. So in that case, we're going to default to something called the mass balance equation, okay? So the total concentration of buffer that I have, okay, is equal to the concentration contributions of all of the buffers. So if I scroll back up here, notice I had, I probably have some amount of H3A, H2A minus, HA2 minus, and A3 minus, okay? So technically, if I wanted to find the total concentration of all the buffer, it has to equal the concentration of H3A, plus the concentration of HA2, H2A minus, plus the concentration of HA2 minus, plus the concentration of A3 minus. Okay, now, there's one thing that we're gonna, we're gonna make a simplifying assumption here, okay? And this is the assumption we're gonna make, all right? Suppose that the pKa that I'm using, okay, the pKa that I'm using that's most applicable for this, remember it has to be really close to the pH that's desired, Let's suppose the pKa that's applicable is this one, this one in the middle, pKa2. Okay, there's a reason I'm doing that is because we're gonna actually gonna use that one in the example. There could be a situation where instead the first one or the third one was the most applicable, but I'm just gonna use the second one. So the first one is, the, or the, excuse me, the second one is the most applicable here, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the species on either side of that pKa. Okay, so that happens to be happens to be H2A minus and HA2 minus, all right? Those are the really, for all intents and purposes, those are the only ones I'm gonna consider in the buffer, okay? As I start to get to pHs far away from that pKa, any other species become pretty much negligible to the point that you can basically say they're zero, all 
Okay, so I'm going to say that the concentration of A3 minus is essentially zero, and the same thing for H3A, it's zero. So that is going to simplify it and lead to the fact that only H2A minus and HA2 minus are in the buffer. Now, could there be some concentration of these ones on either side? Yes, but they're so small that they're not going to change anything and they're not going to produce really any detectable error. Okay? If I had chosen pKa1 as the applicable one, then I'd look at the species on either side of that and say H3a and H2a minus are the applicable ones, and then these two over on the right are zero. Okay, so that's basically what you're doing. Whatever the two are on either side of the pKa that you choose, those are the only ones you consider. Everything else is zero. So if I go back here to the mass balance equation, I'm more or less assuming that H3a is zero, and I'm assuming that A3 minus is zero, which only leaves two choices to deal with, okay? Now, because this one, H2a minus, has one more proton and one higher charge, I'm gonna call this the conjugate acid, and that's what it is, and HA2 minus has one less proton than this one, and one lower charge, so this one's gonna be the conjugate base. And so I'm gonna to refer to them from now on um, like that, okay? So that means that when I look at the total concentration of the buffer, it's now pretty much only equal to the concentration of conjugate acid plus the concentration of conjugate base. And those are these two things right there, okay? Now, what I can do is something that I sort of mentioned above. If I take the volume of the buffer and just multiply each term by the volume, that's what's gonna get me the number of moles. So what I know is the total moles of the buffer which is just, it's calculated by taking the total buffer, vol, uh, buffer concentration times its volume. The number of moles of the buffer has to be equal to the number of moles of conjugate acid plus the number of moles of conjugate base, okay? And then notice what I can do is I can simply subtract number of moles of conjugate acid over to the other side, canceling it there. And then I'm left with this, the number of moles of the buffer minus the number of moles of conjugate acid have to equal the number of moles of conjugate base. Now that's interesting because notice here from, the, from one of the previous, uh, when we were doing the Henderson Hasselbeck, I have this solved for number of moles of conjugate base. And over here, I have this solved for the number of moles of conjugate base. So I have two things that are equal, and so I'm gonna set them equal to each other. So over on the left side, I have this number of moles of buffer minus the number of moles of conjugate acid. I have this. And then from over here, I have chi times the number of moles of conjugate acid. And these are equal because over here, this is equal to moles of conjugate base, and this over here is also equal to the moles of conjugate base, okay? And from this point on, I'm basically just gonna simplify this equation and solve for the number of moles of conjugate acid, okay? So what I can do is I can, I can essentially get all the conjugate acid terms on one side, all right? So I'm gonna add moles of conjugate acid over to this side. Now, remember that because this is, this is just a variable, n of conjugate acid, the coefficient here is one. Okay, a lot of times people forget that. So when I add this over to the other side, I'm actually adding one N sub CA. So I get the number of moles of the buffer are equal to chi times the number of moles of conjugate acid plus one times the number of moles of conjugate acid. That's gonna give me the number of moles of buffer. If I factor out the N sub CA, I'm gonna get number of moles of conjugate acid times chi plus one, all right? And then I can divide through by the quantity chi plus one on both sides, so chi plus one, and then I get this important relationship where the number of moles of conjugate acid are equal to the number of moles of the buffer divided by the, the sum chi plus one. Okay, now remember also, if I wanna calculate the, the total moles of the buffer, all the species in there, the no, total number of moles, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the total concentration of the entire buffer, which is given, and then multiply by the total volume of the buffer and then divide by chi plus one. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you an expanded relationship that is true for any time you do this problem for calculating the moles of conjugate acid, and it's this right here. This is the first, this is the first really important relationship. 
But anytime I want to find the number of moles of conjugate acid, it is always equal to the total concentration of the buffer times the total volume of the buffer, and then you divide by chi plus one. And chi, remember, if you go back up, it's 10 to the pH minus pKa power, and then you just add one. So this is how you find the number of moles of conjugate acid for any um, system that you have for the most part, okay? There's not really any exceptions you're gonna run into in biochem, all right? And so this is the more complicated one to derive, but if you wanted to just default to this on an exam for the number of moles of conjugate acid, this is what you would do, all right? Then to calculate the moles of conjugate base, which is usually the other thing, all I'm gonna do is just take the number or the total concentration of the buffer times the total volume of the buffer, and then just subtract the moles of conjugate acid that I just found here, all right? That's just here, I take C buffer times V buffer minus whatever I find here, and that's the number of moles of conjugate base, okay? So these two relationships are valid for any system that you're gonna basically run into, okay? Now, the thing you have to keep straight is this term is specifically for the conjugate acid, and this one is for the conjugate base on the bottom. If you flip them, and you want to, if you want to do the derivation and solve for the number of moles of the conjugate base, then this expression is actually going to change a little bit. Okay, so this this thing right here that I boxed is only valid for the conjugate acid. All right, so valid for all two species buffers that you're going to deal with. Okay, when you assume all the other species are negligible.